Welcome, my brothers and sisters and mothers and wives and daughters. Welcome. Reading another spiritual audiobook, much in the same vein, perhaps, as my Agora readings. Now, Robert Masters, the author of the Goddess Sekhmet Psycho-Spiritual Exercises of the Fifth Way, I do believe that he um, he wrote the the foreword. What am I doing? What's going on on my screen right now? He wrote the foreword for um, for one for the I think the first Agora book. Here I am, immediately having problems. You know how it be. You know how we do. Why is this happening? Looks like we're off into the races, boys. The Goddess Sekhmet, Psycho-Spiritual Exercises of the Fifth Way, by Robert Masters. Here we see the goddess herself. Some sort of Egyptian carving. A lion head, a sun disk over top. Forward by Kenneth Grant. Should I read all this crap? Let's do it. About the author, a leading pioneer of modern consciousness research, Robert Masters is known as one of the founders of the Human Potentials Movement. Since 1965, he has been the director of research of the Foundation for Mind Research. He has developed the psycho physical method, the psychophysical method, which concerns neural and sensory re-education with Margaret Mead, Margaret Mead, as one of his avid students. As a sexologist, he was an associate of Harry Benjamin, MD, the Dean of American Sexologists. He counts G.I. Gurdjieff, Wilhelm Reich, F.M. Alexander, Milton Erickson, and Moshe Feldenkrais among those who have most influenced him. Books he has written or co-authored include the classic The Varieties of Psychedelic Experience and Mind Games. He lectures and leads tours throughout the world. To write the author, hit this dude up. Tell him you love acid, you love the goddess. I don't know. <laughs> the Goddess Sekhmet, Psycho-Spiritual Exercises of the Fifth Way. By Robert Masters. Now, Gurdjieff is um, mentioned previously. The fifth way here, you see. Um, Gurdjieff had the fourth way. That was his method. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it was some kind of synthesis of um, Hindu yogis, um, Buddhist monks, and Islamic fakirs. The fakirs being Muslim mystics, usually of India, in that area. Copyright 1990 by Robert Masters. All <laughs> no, no rights ever reserved. I am adding transformative acts. Transformative free speech. There's only three types of people in this world. There's free college people. Free speech people and free Israel people. You never know what you're dealing with. Acknowledgements. Acknowledgements. During a period of about one quarter century, I have been actively involved in the work with the goddess Sekhmet, as it has gradually unfolded and will surely continue to unfold throughout this particular existence of mine on a planet which is not the only one where I might have served her. It is also clear now, in retrospect, that the connection to Sekhmet goes back as far in this lifetime as my recollections are able to take me. It is my belief beyond proof, of course, that Sekhmet has affected me throughout my life. I believe, as Ramses II believed it of himself, that I was born out of Sekhmet. That, for an ancient Egyptian, was quite a different statement from the one often routinely made about being born of this or that deity. To be born out of, in this case, asserts a literal fact and reality existing in spiritual dimensions. 
I would require a spiritual autobiography to make my case, and one day I may write one, detailing adequately, at least for me, just why I hold to such a belief. I wish first to acknowledge the goddess who seized me for this work. Sekhmet is loved by me with the whole of my being. I look forward to hearing this called mythomania, or worse, by those who have never known so much as one actual waking moment, either physically or mentally, who have never experienced one shred of, ob of objective knowledge, and who are spiritually dead for all practical purposes. He expects them to call it mythomania. So what is mythomania? Um, putting the two words together, so... It is it is a, a mania, so it's like a neurosis. It's a it's a craziness based on these myths. Which I'm sure people have accused me of, of similar things. I am a mythomaniac. Now I want all of my fellow mythomaniacs out there to do your prayers, say your homework, and thank the mother goddess, brother. Mother. Over the last 15 years, I have enabled a great many persons to have, in varying degrees, experience of what they apprehended as the goddess Sekhmet. The goddess has taught and healed and protected and otherwise rewarded and punished. Some of the phenomena associated with and arising out of this work have been discussed with and often been taken quite seriously by Egyptologists, archaeologists, anthropologists, parapsychologists, open-minded psychiatrists and psychologists, philosophers, authorities on magic, myth, and religion, and persons of many other backgrounds. Many lives have been changed, sometimes drastically transformed, by the contemporary manifestations of Sekhmet. I acknowledge, without including a roster of names, all of those persons just referred to, but especially the ones who have actively and immediately shared with me the more intense and prolonged experiences of the goddess Sekhmet's worlds. I might add that I summarized one such collaboration in the book Psychic Exploration, published in 1974 and edited by former astronaut Edgar Mitchell, explorer of both outer and inner space, and the sixth man on the moon. That particular shared experience of Sekhmet, as well as others that occurred over the years, was of very great interest to another friend, the late anthropologist Margaret Mead, who developed her own strong affinity for Sekhmet. Among artists, I will particularly mention the painter Diana Vandenberg, another friend who did a remarkable portrait of Sekhmet, and who has been described as perhaps the finest Dutch artist since Rembrandt. Two other fine paintings, part of a series, by the American artist Mar Martel, 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 I want to say, are also included and were done in connection with the Brooklyn Museum's ongoing expedition at the Temple of Mut. Mut? Mut? How do you say these Egyptian words? That's my new hurdle that I must jump over as I read this. And appearing for the first time in this edition is a striking Sekhmet painting by Lillian Morgan Lewis, also an American. These are all persons who have proved themselves able in their differing ways to expand the now knowable dimensions of human reality. I would also like especially to acknowledge Michelle Carrier, who took many of the photographs and also shared some early explorations. Michelle, where are you? Other photographs were taken by Paula Rene, and some valuable organizational assistance came from Candace Cave. Last, but by no means least, I wish to acknowledge my wife. Jean Houston. No human being has been so important for me in this work as she, and without her, this work would almost certainly, for many reasons, never have been done. On at least one occasion, early in the work, I, may, I made on the, the magico-spiritual level a mistake that might well have destroyed me. She then saved my life, or, if not my life, then my sanity. The, spiritual knowledge, the spiritually knowledgeable will know that such an assessment is no exaggeration. The details of my act of folly and my rescue will also be reserved for a future autobiography. Jean has supported the work through the years, accompanying me to the temples in Egypt and to other places where the work led me. While she has never been directly involved in this work, her own soul marches to a different drummer. It would be quite impossible for me to overstate her supportive contribution to it. Contents, no spoilers, no spoilers, folks. 
Sekhmet, lady of the place of the beginning of time. Sekhmet, whose essence is fire, tempestuous forever. Great one of magic, grant me success in my endeavor. Blessed be the name of Sekhmet, beloved, her image. I'm going to try to get lots of that in. See what happens in my life. Maybe it'll all go to shit. Finally, once and for all, to shit! I don't know if I have any water. Can I continue these sorts of acts without water? I might step away while you contemplate. Contemplate these words that I have said, the prayer that I have just spoken. Contemplate. I am back. Forward. It does not surprise me that there has been a call for a new edition of this fascinating book by Dr. Masters. This, I don't actually want to read this forward. This is a an edition by, um, in like, I don't know. It's, fuck. I guess I'll read it. It's like a couple paragraphs. Why am I moaning? It does not surprise me that there has been a call for a new edition of this fascinating book. Dr. Masters describes it as a scriptural work, thus claiming for it a higher than mortal authority, a means by which a non-human being manifests to humans in a way suited to the present consciousness of humans. A scriptural work. So much, much like, it reminds me of Crowley channeling the Book of the Law from Iwas. So it is a book for the times. It is a new scripture for the times. Is what and dude, this is why I didn't want to read it. This whole these paragraphs are just jerking off the author, and it does nothing for me. I don't care what this person has to say. If if the author wants to say it, I will listen. Um. Yeah. Anyway, let's let's just get it over with. The reader is warned in no uncertain terms to be prepared to risk transformation or to set aside the book. As one who has had experience in these matters, I endorse and underline this warning. Here are valuable insights and practical formula for establishing contact with other worlds and lucid descriptions of the magical bodies formulated by the adept who explores them. The author's unswerving devotion to the goddess Sekhmet as a gateway to alien realms is captivating and infectious. Such intensity of aspiration will undoubtedly attract more and more readers, not only those who are fitted for the regimen of exercises provided in the latter part of the book, but those in whom the sense of devotion predominates. Dr. Masters divulges the mystical mantra of the goddess, and this, if properly vibrated together with contemplation of the beautiful images of Sekhmet here presented, is sufficient to hurl the soul directly into the presence of the goddess who grants desires. But it should be remembered that Sekhmet is a goddess of the south, the region of flame, and of the dark god Set, lord of the abyss, and of the blackening desert sands, upheaved by terrible winds that smother all in the night of time. One has to tread warily and approach the goddess with a singleness and purity of purpose, such as that which the author himself brings to her shrine. Kenneth Grant, London, 1990 Introduction Robert Masters is, is an explorer of not only the contemporary mind, but also the mind of history and myth. His extraordinary investigations have taken him through the territories of sex and magic, psychotherapy and psychospiritual practices, psychedelics and symbology. In his book on the Egyptian goddess Sekhmet, he brings into our awareness the presence of Sekhmet as an archetypal force that could well have a profound impact on the human psyche in contemporary Western culture. Masters indicates that he has been under the sway of Sekhmet for at least three decades, 
it is clear that Sekhmet has been the ground and fire of his personal initiation. His possession by the goddess has made it possible for him to bring forth her logos, her sacred words as remembered, remembered scripture, as remembered scripture. He has as well introduced the goddess to many who have been taught, healed, and chastened by her. Another fascinating and valuable aspect to his work with Sekhmet is how lost historical, archaeological, mythological, and psychological information can be retrieved in non-ordinary states of consciousness. Conventional historical researchers rely on the interpretation of records of stone, wood, clay, bark, cloth, and paper. The influence of the Western worldview on scholarly works is rarely acknowledged. Masters has obviously done his scholarly homework regarding Egyptian lore, however, his willingness to enter the body of the collective unconscious and ultimately the body of the goddess has yielded fascinating results, not only for Egyptologists, but also for explorers of inner space. This book is a tribute not only to the goddess Sekhmet, but also to Robert Masters' courage, audacity, and imagination. The descriptions of his rich psychic experiences and the presence of the goddess are matched by the wealth of psycho-spiritual exercises that he outlines in the latter part of the book. The description of the five bodies of the human is a meta meta uh, meta Mike, these look, half these are, aren't real words, folks. They just slapped a bunch of shit together. And to sound smart, that's why I'm not very interested in these introductions. Smart people trying to sound smart. Sick of it. Smart people should try to sound dumb. I say that unironically and I will not elaborate. Where was I? The description of the five bodies of the human is a meta-psychology that is a metaphysics as well as a methodology of transcendence. Masters has opened the road again for the Egyptian mystery school to be approached, if not entered. He recalls the main site of worship of the goddess Sekhmet and the gods Ptah and Nefertemen, or what is it, Nefertem? Nefertem. The gods Ptah and Nefertem at the House of Life in Memphis. He recalls the main site of worship of the goddess Sekhmet and the gods Ptah and Nefertem at the House of Life in Memphis. It is clear that the goddess Sekhmet is much older than her brother husband Ptah and her father, the sun god Ra. She is obviously a form of the Great Mother, one who is the mother of all the gods. Her very name, from the word Sekhem, which means strong, mighty, violent, implies that the goddess is directly related to the creative and destructive powers of the sun. The author sees her strongly associated with Kundalini in the Tantric tradition. Kundalini is the energy of unleashed feminine sexuality manifesting as psychic energy. So there's our Gora connection. Fear of the energy of the goddess, particularly in Western culture, has given rise to a kind of civilizational neuroses. We have almost destroyed our world in our attempts to control the wilderness and wild cultures who inhabit remote regions of mind and earth. Through the psychic archaeology of scholars like Robert Masters, the ancient manifestations of pure energy states are being reawakened so that we can enter the mystery of the untamed. The goddess Sekhmet is an energy key that opens the way to this mystery of an undivided nature. So, uh, the key opening the way to the mystery of undivided nature. And in my mind... Um, the problem of the human condition is duality. It is, it is the clashing of animal and divine natures. Um, we see that manifested in, in our ability to create our material world that winds up looking a lot like a hell or a prison. So, often I see it stated that the goddess is the natural world. The natural world births you and gives you everything you need and nurtures you. Um, so in a lot of ways, the goddess represents the world in its dual state. And I guess that makes sense because if you go beyond that to the non-dual, to the unmanifest reality of everything infinitely, that is usually associated with the god. Um... So, 
in a way, you've heard of like passing through the veil, probably. The veil is is often like a a feminine thing. Um, so when you pass through the veil, you get to the god, which is like objective, unmanifest reality, immaterial and timeless. So I think it's trying to say that like through the goddess, through through accepting nature, your nature and the nature around you. That is how you understand undivided nature, the the objective reality, the absolute God. And it's often it's often said that like all of these faces, like you devote yourself to Sekhmet. Okay, like I now I'm a de devotee of Sekhmet, but like I still know that that is not the absolute reality of God. That is one way that the absolute manifests to me in a way that I understand it. And whatever that that's common in many different religions. So, I think that's what we're seeing here. Written by Joan Halifax, Ojai, California, February 14th, 1990. Sugar Walls in the chat, Real Egypt Furry Hours, you know it. Give me a whoop whoop if you're in that chat. Whoop whoop. The ancient Egyptian greeting of whoop whoop. It means both hello and goodbye. Preface and words of caution. It is essential here at the beginning to state that this volume you now hold may powerfully affect you. You stand presently at the threshold of a doorway. You are still free to pass through the door or not, as you will decide. Words of caution are offered to you to assist you in reaching your destination and your decision. Words of caution are offered you and assist you in reaching your decision. Um, so once again, with the door, it's kind of like the veil again. Uh, I, you see it in the Bible. Uh, when Jesus dies, the veil in the temple is torn. And it's like, it's like, so, like God was touched in that moment. The objective, absolute reality. I think that's what's seen here in passing through this door. Should you decide you are going to continue, you will inevitably experience the implanting in your brain, mind, spirit of images and ideas emanating from a non-human reality of the ancient Egyptians called Sekhmet. You will become, to at least some degree, a participant in the goddess Sekhmet's mysteries and in the work of the fifth way. In opening yourself to Sekhmet, you open yourself to direct experience of what for thousands of years has been called the awful and numinous powers of the divine and the magical. You may eventually be led to fulfillments greater than you have yet imagined. Fulfillments greater than any of you have yet imagined. You may be seized by Sekhmet, and then unspeakable horrors as well as indescribable delights are among the possibilities. It is always so when one falls into the hands of the living God. Understand then that this is a scriptural, scriptural work, a means by which a non-human being of the order of beings known as gods and goddesses manifests to humans in a way suited to the present consciousness of humans. Understand that such works, are, works, such works penetrate into the whole being, body, <clears throat> let's focus here. A little bit of water and let's focus before I go on. Understand that such works penetrate into the whole being. Body and mind and spirit. Conscious and unconscious. Cells and souls. Therefore, this book has the power to drastically change you. To alter your reality, more or less. More or less extremely. If it leads deeply into the fifth way, then you will awaken to recognize that you have been living in a kind of demented dream, close to the edges of both madness and death. After that, you will need guidance in a world very strange to you, where wakeful, wakefulness and sanity threaten to consume you with their radiance, where wakefulness and sanity threaten to consume you with their radiance. If you are unwilling to risk transformation, then by all means, set this book aside now. But if you decide to continue, the words of caution have been provided. And now, other words. Something about how it was that this book came to be. It began, speaking just of the writing of this book, 
when the scribe author of much that is communicated here sat entranced before a statue of the goddess. His eyes opened. He first perceived a glowing at the base of the statue, then an aura of red flowed around and beautifully illuminated the whole figure. The lioness-headed goddess, who had been seated, stood and communicated with him, as it seemed to him telepathically. He did not hear the voice, but was told that he would receive information of importance, which he must make every effort to preserve. And I think he calls himself scribe author here. I think that's a, a comparison to Thoth, the scribe of the gods. He was told that certain sacred books of Sekhmet had been lost, pillaged from the temples and destroyed by unbelievers, while others had been carried off by ignorant people who failed to recognize their value and allowed them to disintegrate. In time, the information contained in many of these books would be disclosed, adapted to the needs and understandings of contemporary humans. Among these books were Sekhmet Ra, the Book of Light, Sekhmet Ptah, the Book of Imagination, Sekhmet Bast Hathor, the Book of Good and Evil, Sekhmet Isis, the Book of Love, Sekhmet Getesh, the Book of Lust, Sekhmet Ptah Thoth, the Book of Inspired Wisdom, Sekhmet Ptah Anubis, the Book of Death and Rebirth, Sekhmet Hike, Hike? Hike? Looks like Hike. I'm going to say Hike. Sekhmet Hike, the Book of the Knowledge of Past and Future. Now a soft blue light flowed out from the eyes of Sekhmet, and the scribe's eyes closed. Before him appeared, standing upright, a beautiful black cat the size of a leopard. It wore around its neck a golden collar studded with red stones glowing from within. With this guide, he passed first into a room where an eternal fire was kept. And this fire was fueled by the skeletons of many kinds of creatures, placed upon the blaze by a procession of tall, slim, graceful... Tall, slim, graceful black women, tall, slim, graceful black women, who were naked except for golden, ruby-studded collars, and a diadem engraved with a death's head, serving to indicate their calling. All of these women, he knew, were princesses of tribes of the ancient Libyan lands, and they could never perish so long as the breath of life of Sekhmet was upon them. I want to analyze that a little bit. A fire fueled by the skeletons of many kinds of creatures. Placed upon the blaze by a procession of tall, slim, graceful black women who were naked except for golden, ruby-studded collars and diadem engraved and a, and a diadem engraved with a death's head serving to indicate their calling. So, the fire is, is usually... I want to say the fire is often the absolute. So this fire being fueled by the lives lived of many creatures, um, all of us and in our incarnations, keeping this thing going, perhaps. Um, the black women strike me as like Kali type figures. Um, you know, Kali is is a like a death goddess in India. Um, she's dripping with blood, holding fucking heads and skulls, adorned with the body parts. Um, so I think something like that is going on here. So it's sort of like um, Kali operating as an agent of the Absolute to, to keep, you know, death and rebirth going, destruction and creation going. Got a whoop whoop in the chat from Mugwort. That's what I want to see. He was escorted by an altar, or to an altar, by tall, powerful figures wearing breastplates of leather human... Let's try this again. He, he was escorted to an altar by tall, powerful figures wearing breastplates of leather, human-bodied, but with the heads of birds, the predatory beaks, and fierce, burning eyes of hawks. Brings to mind Horus. A priestess with red hair, whose beauty astounded him, burst into flames and was consumed. A green snake came and slithered through the ashes. A dwarf came, dragging an ankh larger than himself, 
paused to read the message on the floor, and then went on. A large bird wearing a Sekhmet amulet flew slowly three times in a circle around the hieroglyphics. Then the meaning was revealed. The Temple of Sekhmet is the Womb of Visions. This reminds me of like DMT experiences. You have dwarves, little people, the snakes. I always see the snakes when I do things that are uh, related to, to DMT. I always have thought, uh, it's hard to explain, but the patterns on the, uh, the peripherals of my vision turns to snakes and dancing women, which is always the type of vibes I get from uh, these, you know, Agora, from this book, from these books that are honoring, like, this, this violent mother goddess who can also be very caring. All around him, the fleshy walls of the temple were glistening and wet, bathed red by the dancing of the sacred and invisible flames. The walls rippled, sometimes lightly convulsing, the spasms generating phantoms of the shadows, these assuming briefly vivid colors, depth, life, and then dissolving back into shadowy forms, from which new images emerged, taking on the aspect of a surreality. This reminds me of what Terence McKenna would often call the dome when you smoke DMT and you go to a temple of churning walls and colors that look slick and wet and they're black and silver and purple and blue and they just, hmm, beauty. It's beautiful. That is where the goddess appeared to me, by the way. In my experience. Personally. Jakob talking here. Images sinuously weaving their way up from within obscure places in himself, passed out of his body and intermingled with the temple images, interacting with them, assuming the same brief, vivid reality, then dissolving as new forms replaced them. He no longer could determine which forms emanated from his body and which appeared to be the children of the temple. His emotions and sensations were experienced in identification with first one visionary being, then another. Pale at first, gaining high intensity, diminishing as, uh, as the forms first emerge, vivified and then dissipated in an incessant flowing of becoming, being, slipping away towards non-being, being born again in the becoming of something new and different. Human, animal, or combining elements of both. This all seems to be uh, images referencing reincarnation. When I was in a place much like this, and a woman made of snakes and leaves and vines and jungle came to me, she buried me under the remains of all the animals and living things that have ever lived. And right after that, a rose bloomed in my face. And I think it's a similar imagery. Surrounded by the undiluted blackness of void, his body, which he now observed from a distance, was white as if made from ivory. It gleamed as it drifted, slowly circling as the weightless bodies of astronauts might drift, as the weightless bodies of astronauts might drift and slowly circle in space. The body appeared to diminish in size, and he reasoned that this meant an increasing distance between the body and his perception of the body, the means of the perception being a mystery. He decided that he must be dying or had died and found himself calling four times the name of Sekhmet, hoping that by her intervention his life might be saved or restored. Within the temple, the walls were alive and writhing with serpents, intertwining with the long and richly jeweled fingers of women. Seated on her throne, centered in a circle, within which light was seen rising out of symbols, was Sekhmet, unmoving center above the circle, Unmoving center above the circle, which was spinning. What does that mean? What does that mean? Seated on her throne, centered in a circle, within which light was seen rising out of symbols, was Sekhmet, unmoving, center above the circle, which was spinning. That's a weird sentence. He felt himself to be in the presence of the living Sekhmet, from whom he could not bear to be separated. Then he no longer knew who he was or that he was. He was told later that his body in the chair moved into the exact posture of the Sekhmet statue seated on its throne, and his face became the face of Sekhmet. 
So that feeling of when you're in the presence uh, with the goddess from whom he could not bear to be separated, uh, then it says he no longer knew who he was or that he was. This is the experience of a baby in the arms of its mother. That's exactly what that is. And that is the feeling you get when something like this comes to you. You're exactly where you need to be. You're back in the womb. Floating. Floating like an astronaut. Midwest Viking are in the chat. Whoop, whoop, dude. There was an apparent infusion of power into his body, as if his body were being charged with some actual physical energy, causing it to become visibly more powerful. Furthermore, he seemed to experience an enrichment of every capacity, his presence becoming mythic, superhuman, for those who were observing him. Next, there was an abrupt dissipation, a deflation, as if too, as if too much had been fed, fed in too soon. As if body-mind, menaced, reflexively rejected, and expelled the force that could not be any longer tolerated, or as if the force were at all at once withdrawn, the danger being recognized by the intelligence directing the infusion. After that, just before the trance terminated, there was brief contact with what was taken at the time to be a secondary personality speaking through him, with a voice that was very curious, as if the speaker vacillated between being male and female. The words, I will teach and you will learn. In many ways I will teach. In many ways you will learn. The work will be done. What in the chat, Dune Pepe? Whoop whoop. Are you ready for the invocation of Sekhmet? Uh, Mod, make sure you turn your audio all the all the way up for this. I want Allah to hear what I have to say. Bring the entire Uma into the room to listen with you. As it was. At Memphis, so be it now. Hear me, I beseech thee, O powerful one. Lady of Raket, Lady of Peket, Lady of Set, Lady of Rehisawi, Lady of Tichar, and of Saheri, Mother in the horizon of heaven in the boat of millions of years, thou art the great defender. Thou art overthrower of Kitu. Preserve us from the evil chamber of the souls of Hes, uh, Hes Hira, of the souls of Hes Hira. Deliver us from the abode of fiends, O thou who art. Sekhmet, life giver to the gods. Sekhmet, lady of flame. Sekhmet, great one of magic. Sekhmet eternal is thy name, O hear me now. Sekhmet with lioness head. Sekhmet whose color is red. Sekhmet, daughter of Ra, Sekhmet, consort of Ptah. Sekhmet, mighty is thy name, oh hear me now. Sekhmet, goddess of pestilence. Sekhmet, goddess of wars. Sekhmet, queen of the wastelands. Sekhmet, terrible is thy name, oh come to me. Sekhmet, destroyer of rebellions. Sekhmet, scorching eye of Ra. Sekhmet, protector, ruler, Sekhmet, holy is thy name. Oh, reveal thyself to me. Sekhmet, mother of the gods. Sekhmet, mistress of the crowns. Sekhmet, thou art, ca thou art called only one. Sekhmet, beloved is thy name. Possess me now, O great one. Sekhmet, greater than Isis. Sekhmet, greater than Hathor. Sekhmet, greater than Bast. Sekhmet, greater than Mat. Sekhmet, mysterious is thy name. I am lost in mystery. Sekhmet, preeminent one. Sekhmet, light beyond darkness. Sekhmet, sovereign of her father. Sekhmet, hidden is thy name. Rapturous, my dying. 
Lady of Ampt, Lady of Manu, Lady of Sa, Lady of Tepnef, Lady of Heaven, thou art Omniti Seshet, Destroyer, Upholder. Thou art the terror before which fiends tremble. Thou art lust, thou art life, ever burning one. Teka Haresa. Pusar em kakar emet. Sefi perem hes hura hepu tichetif. Mistress of enchantment, source and word of power, forbidden is thy name. I am the sealed one. Do not consume us with thy fire. Give us light. O lady, mightier than the gods, an adoration rises unto thee. All beings hail thee, O lady, mightier than the gods. Preserve beyond death that secret name, O being called Sekhmet. At the throne of silence, even shall no more be spoken than encircling one. I lose myself in thee. The goddess Sekhmet for this book. I am the one who knows the way in and the way out. This book introduces a fifth way, the way of the five bodies, as it was in Egypt, but also new knowledge blended with the old to open the fifth way. This book serves the purposes of Sekhmet and of humans. It fulfills the need to multiply the images of Sekhmet. All of time is to me nothing more than the flick of a cat's whisker. But now is the time for this work. On the night called Sekhmet, all humans will dream the same dream. Then, what do you think they are going to open their eyes to? The cat has been let out of the bag. Humans must now support the new temple of Sekhmet, the fifth way. Then the greatness that once was, the greatness that once was will become the greatness now. Not the same but as it should be and must be. Sekhmet does bless this work. The Way of the Five Bodies According to an extremely ancient tradition, distorted variations of which are part of many religious, spiritual, magical, and occult systems, the human being has five bodies, all interactive, but each one having a dimension or reality in which it lives and functions, and which is of the same substance as that body. These bodies and realms in order of subtle subtlety are the most subtle, spiritual body, Egyptian Sahu, the increasingly less subtle, magical body, Ku, Shadow, shadow I haven't said a single one of these right, and I'm saying the English words, I'm getting the Egyptian words right here. Spiritual body is Sahu, the increasingly less subtle, the magical body, Ku, Shadow, Haidit, Double, Ka, and the physical body, Aufu. So you have the spiritual body, the magical body, the shadow body, your double, and the physical body. The way of the five bodies requires a consciousness which simultaneously differentiates each of the five while at the same time all of the five are functionally integrated. There is a meta-psychology meta and a methodology for achieving this ideal and, as well, an underlying metaphysic. The way is practical and realizable, although extraordinarily demanding. It can explain much and lead to accomplishments which would otherwise be impossible. If it is humanly valid, then it is not just Egyptian, although its known source is the magico-spiritual way of the goddess called Sekhmet by the Egyptians. I will discuss the metaphysic briefly, the metapsychology, which can be tested in considerably more de detail. In considerably more detail. According to this way, there are two primordial, coexisting, interactive, and absolutely antagonistic realities, 
cosmos, the powers and principalities of order, and chaos, the disordered powers and principalities. There, uh, yeah, the essentially, the essentially ir irrepresentable powers, the essentially irrepresentable powers are functionally represented by netters or beings experienced by humans as gods and goddesses, angels and demons, and others known to religion and mythology. These powers and their principalities and for us are hi hierarchical. These powers in their principalities and for us are hierarchical, and in our terms, good or evil. They are locked in. Uh, they are locked in a thus far perpetual struggle, each seeking the other's transformation. They are indestructible, but subject to transformation, so that a final resolution would be the transforming of chaos into cosmos, or that of cosmos into chaos. Out of this conflict, sometimes called the war in heaven, have arisen intermediate re realities, including the human. Okay, so the way I understand all of this, these two, this is what I was talking about before, how it's like, this is the nature of man, is this like divine and animal reality that are always clashing. That is not the absolute reality, that is simply our experience of reality as far as I know. And I don't know if this is saying like that clash is the absolute, I don't know if this is a dual idea at the core. We'll find that out as we go. Um, but that's kind of what I get out of this. So the war in heaven, it, it applies to my thinking. When I, when I see Maya in Eastern religion as the same thing as Satan, essentially, um, in, in its Hebrew form, in the Hebrew form of the word, in like the Old Testament form, Satan means adversary or persecutor. It is not... You, not usually used. It's used many times in the Old Testament, and it's almost always used to represent, like, people or systems. I don't want to say always. Someone can come and argue about this. You can bring up the book of Job, this and that. But usually when the word Satan is used, it's, it's often used to describe, like, people or powers that are against God. That is the adversary of God. That's your adversary. Oftentimes... Your worst enemy is yourself. We all know this. Like, we can be our own Satan, our own adversary. Someone once told me that people don't like to talk about the devil because they don't like to look at themselves in the mirror. I think there's a lot of truth to that. So when we get to this war in heaven, um, that brings me to, like... You know, I, don't, I don't think that uh, holy angels can sin. I don't think they can rebel from God. I think the war in heaven is a metaphor for something that goes on in our minds. And I, I do think it is this dual nature. And I think Satan can be seen most clearly within the hearts and minds of man. Almost lost my vape. I like this image. This is awesome. Cosmos, Urgods, I think he's going to explain that more as we go. Divine, <laughs> Metatalons, Metatalon, Metatalons, Spiritual Order, Sahu, Ku, Hadith, Ka, Aufu, Disordered Particles, Demonic Metatalons, <laughs> Urdemons, Chaos. So here we see an order of realities, I guess. With cosmos being like the perfected reality. I want to say Urgods is probably like, you know, the gods that are worshipped. I don't know what divine metatalons means. Something tells me that's like, something tells me that's like angels or something, something along those lines, like helpful spirits. Spiritual order, if I had to guess, is like um, the priesthood. And then it, the Sahu is like your highest body. And then it goes down from there. What was the alpha? The physical body is the alpha, so that is the lowest level there. And below that, you get to like uh the like the molecular structure, I guess, disordered particles. I don't really know what that means. Demonic metatalon, so that's like piece of shit spirits. Ur-demons, which I guess is like devils, and chaos, which is just like 
absolute darkness. The furthest you can be from God, perhaps. But here we see another God. Like, I don't know if Set here, I think this is Sekhmet and Set. I don't know if, I guess they are portrayed as opposites on a spectrum. Yet still being part of one thing. One objective absolute reality, maybe? I don't think I don't think Cosmos is the absolute. I think all of this at once is the absolute. We haven't heard any mention of the absolute, I don't think. The whole of reality has substance, but is neither material nor spiritual. Hmm. Hmm. Are we getting right where I want to be? And it is more or less subtle in varying degrees. Much of it is altogether inaccessible to and unknowable by humans. Some of it can be glimpsed or revealed, but not participated in by human beings. Within an exceedingly narrow sector of the whole of reality is the dimension of the human. <clears throat> So I guess that's what this is saying, is that like the, the circle as a whole, all of it, is the absolute. And these are all just dimensions, some of which can be experienced, some of which cannot. The present situation may be very roughly described in the following manner, with references to positioning in space understood as a convenience and not essentially veridical. Veridical? At the bottom is chaos, a realm of such subtlety that it could, if experienced, be misunderstood as void or non-being, also darkness. In terms of the war in heaven, this realm and the, existence the existences natural to it are the place and the ur-gods of evil, working with absolute intensity toward the transformation of cosmos into chaos. To human reasoning, the fact of such forces itself implies a kind of order. But that is not true, and the order is a fabrication of minds which cannot grasp the mystery. I hope Maud's still listening to this. I feel like this is all, like, right up his alley, except for the fact that we're, like, worshipping some pagan god. I'm not worshipping it yet, dude. I just like the mother goddess a lot. Maud always talks about how the, the demons are from the void. Primordi primordially, primordially contiguous to chaos is cosmos, the place and forces of order, good, light, creative harmony, and the cosmic ergods. Implacable as the chaos, cosmos unwaveringly and with absolute intensity, implaca Im implacably, implacable. <laughs> what is that word? I gotta look this up. I feel mega stupid. Google, help me out here. Implacable. Implacable. That was my first instinct. Should have went with it. Um, yeah. Implacable as chaos, Cosmos unwaveringly, unwaveringly and with absolute intensity pursues the goal of transformation. Cosmos and chaos are of the same degree of subtlety, and only their subtle substance is completely and eternally real. Yet it is as if there have come, they have come to be in a space between cosmos and chaos, dimensions of being which most fundamentally are the arenas of conflict in which the struggles of the forces take place. These arenas and conflicts and combatants have substance of varying degrees of subtlety, but more fundamentally, they are appearances, imaginal constructs, functional representations of the essentially irrepresentable powers and principalities. And as I keep saying powers and principalities, it does bring to mind Ephesians 6.12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. The so-called material and spiritual worlds, including humans and their worlds, are such appearances and representations, 
something like particles of mind, temporarily giving different kinds of existence and in some instances degrees of autonomy. These mysteries also go beyond human understanding. What is important to really know and to fully believe is that man and his worlds are not at all what they seem to be. That the apparent reality is far more malleable and subject to directed transformation than we are taught that it is or seems to be. And that those belief systems which sustain such illusions as immuta immutability and objectivity are also subject to alteration. All laws of nature amongst them. Above chaos is the created and already imaginal realm of the demonic metatalons. I'm gonna fucking... <laughs> What's gonna happen if I try to look that word up? What's going to happen? How do, I, how do you spell this crap? Matty Dolans. Matty Dolan, Matty Dolans, dude. Let's see if that's even a real word, or if Google just fucking winged it, dude. <laughs> DuckDuckGo has no results at all for that word, so I'm gonna say it however the frick I please. So yeah, above chaos is the created and already imaginal realm of the demonic metatalons. Met, met, <laughs> met, 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 meta idolons? Meta meta idolon meta idolons. That probably does meta is probably part of that. Meta idolons. Evil gods, demons, and other chaotic entities. Correspondingly, below cosmos is the realm of the divine meta idolons, gods and goddesses, angels, demons, and others. This realm too is created and imaginal, and it is the meta meta idolons, whether of cosmos or chaos, which interact directly with the human dimensions. A few, the most potent of these great meta idolons, represent the ur gods of the two primordial realities. Above the realm of the meta idolons of chaos is the disordered material realm of the subatomic particles, matter, with chaotic, not just unpredictable, positions and velocities. This is the reality which is referred to by the second law of thermodynamics, predictive of the eventual triumph of chaos. Similarly, below the realms of the meta idolons of cosmos, there is a realm of spirit, and equally potent and seemingly irrefutable laws of uh, teleology, predictive of evolution of consciousness and eventual transformation of matter into spirit. It is also, however, however, an imaginal realm without true immutable laws and is part of the transient, created arena, the space between cosmos and chaos. It is also called the realm of evolutionary order. So that's very interesting. It's something, a way I've never thought of it before. So below physical man, you have like the, the arena of subatomic particles and stuff like that. Above the physical man, you have like a, a spiritual order of being that's like, it's, it's immaterial by nature, yet it is very comparable to the, the molecular or particle reality beneath us. So it, once again, it illustrates the fight in man between material and divine. <clears throat> Next, limiting discussions, uh, limiting discussion to humans and their worlds. There are five human realities, each of them potentially knowable by man, who is able to participate in them by means of the five bodies he or she possesses. These are the gross and subtle bodies encountered in all major spiritual traditions and systems of magic and occultism. The understanding of them is distorted, however, and some systems, for example, subcategorize while others lump together, thus arriving at three, seven, nine, or some other number of bodies and their respective realities. The five human dimensions or worlds are a midpoint between the realities of chaotic matter and evolutionary spirit. 
the gross material or physical body, or just physical body, alfu, is the body of anatomy and physiology, and it is what most people think they mean by my body. This body, however, has a brain but no mind, and is therefore not the body of most existence, as will be explained more fully later. The second, more subtle body is the double, ka, and it is the body usually experienced by the mind of that body. It is a body image, coincides more or less with the alfu, and its sensations also are images or more... What is this I'm trying to say? It coincides more or less with the alfu, and its sensations also are images or, more precisely, symbolic representations of an imaginal reality, which it in many ways distorts. Okay, so it's saying that your double is your actual conscious reality that you were experiencing. And your alfu is your physical body. It is like your vehicle, I want to say. I think that's what's going on. Is Ka is the driver, alfu is the vehicle. Um, so the, the vehicle is what decodes and, and does all of these things. Uh, or, I don't want to say decodes. Your vehicle is the one that's like... God, it's so hard to explain all this stuff. But I, th I think it's implying that your brain is is taking in stimuli and decoding it into mind, into your experience. But what you are actually experiencing and seeing and feeling and touching is not like what's really there. It's a distorted image of it. Um, it is the way all your brain decodes all these things that tells you what you were experiencing. It the there is a ton of stimu stimuli that you are not you are just not even programmed, designed to experience that more accurately represent the objective reality that you are in. But there is a veil over it. I think is where we're going with this. This distortion is recognized by psychology, so, so that some authors speak, for example, of a symbolic coding of the actual reality done by the brain or the brain-mind, quite apart from metaphysics. One can accept that the experience of one's so quite apart from metaphysics, one can accept that the experience of one's own and other bodies is not immediate but mediated by the mind and occurs in the mind or brain if one chooses to regard mind as epiphenomenon of the brain. As the Ka's world is more subtle than the Alfu's, similarly, the third body and world of the shadow is more subtle than that of the Ka, the shadow being the Haidit. 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 This is a reality ordinarily experienced as altogether mental and mostly unconscious. The world, for example, of most dreams and most images experienced in trance and drug states. It can be a world of either the personal or the collective or transpersonal unconscious. A world that is the source of many works of art and which figures also in other sorts of creativity. And which figures also in other sorts of creativity. Many fail to consider that in, say, the dream world, they have a body which is not the body of everyday experience, and that the dream world also is a different reality, the dream body and dream worlds being unfettered by many of the laws which bind the world of the ordinary waking consciousness. As is true of the Ka and the other subtle bodies, the Haidit is part of an inter... Uh, part of and interactive with that constellation of five bodies which is the human being. Therefore, its experiences can affect the others, particularly those inferior to it in subtlety, but the more subtle bodies also. Such interactions are most strikingly apparent in cases where the unconscious is clearly in a uh, causal relationship to the sickness or healing of the physical body or the mind. Once again, this world of experience is well known to psychology. What is not grasped sufficiently, however, is that the world of the Haidit, or shadow, is equally as real as the objective world, that the body of the Haidit is also equally real, and that the failure to recognize these facts is damaging and severely limiting. We see here, uh, the shadow is equally as real as the objective world, objective in quotes, because he, he is saying, like, what you perceive as objective reality, while that is not objective reality at all. That is seemingly the objective reality of the Ka. But the only way to approximate objective reality is the combination of all of these bodies. When you understand all of them and they can affect each other in a complementary way. The magical body and its world, or Ku, 
are only rarely consciously experienced, but shape importantly that work of art or myth which the Haidit in its own consciousness lives, and which it imposes on the Ka, which in turn lives out the same myth, but almost always unconsciously. These subtler realities, then, very largely determine the fate of the Alfu, including accidents apart, when and how it will deteriorate and die. Accidents apart. Is it not, so it's not counting accidental deaths or something? I don't understand. In ancient times, when such matters were better understood, the Ku was not thought of as magical but as magico-spiritual, the line between magic and religion being artificial and imposed on human thinking by religions which already had lost much of their awareness and potency. When I hear that, it's it's uh, mysticism and religion is more kind of how I understand that. When he's using the word magic, I'm kind of understanding it more as what I think of as mysticism. Mysticism being like the closeness to God. And basically, I guess it's like... Um, when you're in the zone, kind of, you know what I mean? Like, uh, there is a state of being, and it has many, many names in many religions, many, many different cultures, but there is like a state where, like, it's almost like God is creating directly through you. You are in touch with Him, your mind is singly focused, not necessarily on Him, but single, singularly focused. And when that happens, like, when, when the human does that, that's almost like a superhuman act, and God works through you. And now he's talking about, like, the shadow influencing the Ka, influencing the material body. And I, he was saying, like, the shadow body is what experiences, like, uh, drug hallucinations and dreams and stuff like that. And I very much get that, like, the way some of these things can be, these experiences that by all Western knowledge, just are not real, will impact you for the rest of your life, and you will live by them. I wanted to mention that before I forgot. In ancient times, yeah, the coup was not thought of as magical, but as magico-spiritual, the line between magic and religion being artificial and imposed on human thinking by religions which already had lost much of their awareness and potency. And that, that once again, it's like the loss of mysticism in Western religion, to me. The Ku was the second order reality, and work of the magician priest, only later just of the magician. To live and act consciously in the Ku, it is necessary to undergo a prolonged and very rigorous training. There are brief, spontaneous experiences of it, most often triggered by unusual stress and a resultant alteration of consciousness. Also, in some more primitive societies, shamans, witch doctors, and similar figures still attain to fragmentary knowledge of the coup, and thus can generate some paranormal effects, but these fall far short of what is possible. Nevertheless, the importance of the coup, which can serve either cosmos or chaos, is very great. Functioning unconsciously insofar as the less subtle bodies are concerned, it affects them and their worlds quite apart from, the determining, from determining the myth that is lived out. I'm going to read that again. Functioning unconsciously insofar as the less subtle bodies are concerned, it affects them and their worlds quite apart from from determining the myth that is lived out. So it seems like while that part of you is kind of asleep, it, it doesn't have much effect on you, I guess. Each person is to some extent an unconscious magician, affecting his world, including other persons by telepathic, psychokinetic, and other means. In some cases, this unconscious magic can be extremely potent. I find that very often. I find that very often. I... <laughs> I'll like... I have a tendency... I feel like my magic is pretty fucking strong. I don't talk about that very often because it's like... One, one thing I've learned from studying the occult is if you tell people about your magic, what you're doing, what's going on in your mind, how the fuck you influence things, it loses all its power. So you, you can't do it. And not only... It's like... Because, first of all, it's not like, oh, they're going to know, and they're going to know how it's done, and they can circumvent it. No. They they will laugh at you, and their mind will be fortified by, by their just finding it, like, goofy. They will be fortified by that. They will not believe. They will, it will be, it will not work. But, like, I, I find myself unconsciously, like, I've, I've been at work a few times, 
and like I'm I'm thinking about shit. Something's going on. Uh, for example, like I, there was cleaning or like work being done, cleaning and like um, fucking like remodeling going on at my job. And I'm I'm looking at what they're doing. I'm trying to like prepare for it, and I'm telling everyone around me like, all right, well I've I've done this kind of work before, so I kind of have an idea of what's going on here. And like, as I'm going over it in my mind, I know I'm getting like kind of stressed out because there's a lot of prep that's involved uh, before it happens. And I'm like, I'm talking to people about it, and I can tell like as I'm talking, I I'm a very fucking persuasive person for some reason. As, I, as I'm talking to them, they're getting all fucking amped up about it. And they're believing everything I'm saying. They're believing every word of it. Because I've said I've like done a job like this before. That didn't mean I know everything about it. And I'm, that doesn't mean all that. But like by the time we're done, there's been so much overkill preparing for it that it was just silly. And none of it was even the reality. And everybody acted goofy because of me. Nobody's blaming me because I said outright. Like, I don't, I don't actually know. I'm just saying things that are going on in my head as I'm overthinking things. And it can make just all people around you act goofy as hell. That seems very subtle. It seems like that's not very significant. Like, of course, you can gaslight people into being spazzes. But, like, once again, this is the very subtle application of affecting other people's wills and the world around you. Now, if I actually know what I'm doing, and I'm doing it on purpose, like, I can be... I can manage a job with a bunch of people under me and confidently say what's going on and they will act on on what I'm saying. They will learn from it and they will they will act on the things I am saying and have taught them without even thinking about it. Like that's the proper application for like normal will affecting in human life. But like even an example like that, my point is you can see how how like those sorts of thoughts can it can just be like an explosion of nonsense. And also, that sort of thing is very clear uh, when you have a bunch of people tripping on psychedelics together, and like one person says something, and it, it can you don't even have to say anything. Fucking scratch your nose, and everybody knows a scratch your nose trick when you're talking to someone and they'll scratch your nose. Shit like that when you're on fucking when you're like tripping together with people, everyone will be triggering the shit out of each other. And if you are sitting there and you start getting paranoid, like other people will start getting fucking paranoid. You've no fucking idea why. But, like, it's always weird shit. Like, just minds influencing minds. Implatinable. Impl <laughs> Did I say a word? It was really implatinable. What the hell is that word? Clint Eastwood indoors in the chat. What up, dude? Holy crap, YouTube censorship is BS these days. Yeah, YouTube is borderline unusable unless you're like an autistic zoomer, to be totally honest. Borderline unusable. I'm I'm like switching over to Odyssey more and more, and that's sad because Odyssey sucks too. Odyssey is like YouTube in 2012, but shittier. Mugwur Urgods or Urgot. That's a that's a good call. That's a good call. Does sound similar, homie. Yeah, Clint Eastwood indoors, dude. Clint, tell me what's going on. What's going on with the censorship for you, big guy? The highest and most subtle body and world is the Sahu, or spiritual body. Which again, more appropriately, should be magico-spiritual, but of the first order. This is the world of authentic religious experience. As it is attained as it is attained to by rigorous practitioners of spiritual disciplines, holy men, saints, spiritual masters, whatever they may be called in a particular system. In the ancient traditions, the high magician priest, that too was so high, he was expected to be able to experience and work with the realities of both Ku and Sahu. Presently, however, spiritual disciplines largely eschew the magical reality, aiming only at passive consciousness of the spiritual one. More rarely, spiritual work and interactions with netters. This limitation is crippling for spiritual development, and the true goal must be complete consciousness. That is, the knowledge and use of all five bodies, all five of the bodies in their respective dimensions. Similarly, the magician is crippled if his or her consciousness and work do not extend beyond the coup. 
this reminds me of implications of like Kali Yuga, the different ages that people go through, that humanity goes through, where you have like a golden age where everybody's connected to God. We use telepathy, we could this and that. Like you can, you basically have the powers of Jesus is, is the essence that I get out of it. And then you work your way, like you, you, it breaks, you work your way through the Yugas. It's a big cycle. There's, I don't know how many there are, but presently most sources will say we are in the Kali Yuga where there are no saints. All of these metaphysical powers are like unknown. I think one implication I've gotten a lot is that like the, the knowledge of the subtle forces of nature become lost but then as you go up they be regained and i think we're coming out of the kali yuga and that's what the birth pangs of this whole fucking thing we're going on with in society is it's like we're breaking out of this like this hell age into a, a better age um but yeah like discovering things rediscovering things like um electricity being able to use the internet like uh like just like a radio signal that is a sign that humans are beginning to understand the more subtle energies that's what i've heard said at least the sahu is the only human reality which is congenial to the cosmic gods. Although such beings may descend all the way into the realm of the Alfu, which, however, is excremental to them. Excremental? It is sh shit. Donkey Duke Dick Dubs! Eh! The gods of chaos ordinarily ascend only to the realm of the Ku when a black magic is practiced. However, some of the most potent sometimes invade the Sahu, so that even the holiest of men or women is not secure from them. Also, the most powerful of black magicians can work with meta, meta idolons representing the ergods of chaos at this level, thus affecting the most potent evil. Hmm. I would like a an example of one of these Ur-Gods of Chaos. Now, he's saying that the, the Black Magicians work with the meta Eidolons, being like demons, to communicate with, like, the devils or whatever. This is kind of what I'm getting at this. I would like more detail about that. Having now, in one possible way, summarized the background against which the human drama is played, my discussion will hereafter be limited to the human realities. The five bodies of man, hmm, I want more. The dimensions appropriate to each of these bodies, and the functional metapsychology which can be effectively worked with, worked with once their existences have been made known. However, before examining more completely the gross physical body and its place in metapsychology, Something needs to be said about the animation of the body and certain other elements which are required if it is to be human. In addition to the five bodies, the human being also has two spirits. One of these is commonly referred to as the soul, Ba. And like the bodies, it is an arena in which the great opposing forces contend. In a larger way, but also for control of the person's bodies and his or her life. The Ba is imperishable. Or almost so, unlike the other spirit, the Sakim, which dies along with the physical body and is a kind of foundation for consciousness, a link between body and mind. I, I feel like that's related to the, uh, the word Jiva in Hinduism, but I'm not sure. At birth, the five bodies and the two spirits coalesce, a process that begins at the moment of conception, but only is completed at the time of the physical birth. Also, at conception, the breath of life, or Sa, must be released and entered in. It is this Sa, or life force, that the gods can draw upon for immortality. When a god chooses to die, he can do so by abstaining from a periodically needed assimilation of the Sa. A human who gains access to the Sa, by magical means, can use it to extend his or her own life. And that reminds me of Prana. Prana in Hinduism, how they, there are saints who who reserve their prana, and uh, when by holding in their prana, they are able to live for two hundred years. They are able to stop their breathing and pulse completely, as far as like medical science can tell. 
and still they they are in a state of meditation, a deep state of meditation. They are fine. And when human beings of special gifts, when a human being of special gifts is conceived, one especially destined to serve cosmos or chaos, forces will contend to ensure or prevent the infusion of Sa, even though that occurs in the barest instant after fertilization. Cosmos and Chaos designate many more such intended children of destiny than ever effectively reach the world. Either the Sa infusion is blocked, the infant is destroyed in the womb or at birth, or the person may be removed at any time later on, whenever he or she is vulnerable. Despite attempts at protection, it is very rare that such gifted and chosen humans survive to carry out the work assigned to them. Cosmos and Chaos are equally merciless in their efforts to eliminate the designates, since even one since even one such person can drastically affect the human race. Another image of Sekhmet. So yeah, we have the forces of good and evil contending for the children in the womb that they may not carry out their purpose. And I think we will get to this next chapter on my next reading, the Alfu, the physical body. We will learn more about the gross physical body. Disgusting. Hit me up. Patreon.com slash Yakov Alive. Go to Yakubees.com. Listen to podcasts. Hit that merch tab for sweet t-shirts. At Skinwalker Gang on Twitter. Hit me up on the Fediverse. Got many accounts. Find me on the Fediverse. I'm there. Look for a Yakov. You'll find me. Catch you next time. Whoop, whoop.